G'day, g'day. It's Nick here and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. And in today's video, I'd like to talk a bit about zoos and wildlife parks. In particular, I'd like to address a discussion that I recently had with a member of the public who is very anti zoos and captivity. And that is, why do zoos keep and breed and display species that aren't endangered in the wild? If it's really all about conservation, why do zoos display and house common species? So stick around guys, we're having a bit of a chat about captivity. So, first of all, I'd like to point out that this is not a debate about the conservation worth of zoos and wildlife parks. All sorts of species, from condors to Przewalski's wild horse to the Panamanian golden frog, exist today only because of the work done by zoological institutions. So, I understand there's a lot of people out there who are strongly against zoos, but uh, that's a, a whole discussion for another time. But, whether or not it's worth breeding species or keeping and housing species that aren't endangered, uh, and whether this is ethical or whether this is taking away from maybe funding that could go towards an endangered species, is a conversation that I personally feel is worthwhile having. And the first reason that I think that it makes sense that zoos keep and display the more common species in captivity is it generates income. Now, as soon as I say this, I'm sure there is a bunch of animal rights activists out there saying, I knew it was all about the money. It's not necessarily the case. The thing is, funding wildlife conservation, whether it's in situ or ex situ, so whether it's zoos sending money overseas and helping animals in their wild environments, or whether it's them breeding them on their premises, requires a lot of money. Here in Victoria, Australia, Zoos Victoria, our three government owned zoos, they breed a total of 21 locally endangered species. And most of these species are really small things. They're orange bellied parrots and, and small skinks and endangered frogs, things that people aren't gonna pay 21 or 25 or 30, 40 bucks to come and visit. What people go to these institutions to look at is things like kangaroos and lions and tigers and large parrots and all these sorts of things. And this money that people spend to go there is used to fund all sorts of breeding programs. In fact, just about any breeding program done at most of the zoos that I've dealt with in the past actually happen off display. They're not available for the public to look at because they want these animals completely uninterrupted, not overly habituated to people in case one day their offspring is used for release programs. And the only way that they're funded is people coming to the zoo to look at other animals which in turn helps this money go towards their endangered counterparts. So yeah, zoos do keep some animals to make money because without making money, they simply can't be proactive in the conservation of endangered species. So that's number one. Zoos have to generate some income and the more iconic species are really, really useful for that. The second reason why it's really important that zoos don't forget about species that might not be on the endangered species list is because by keeping and breeding animals that might not be at risk of extinction, we learn all sorts of things about the husbandry and breeding and reproduction of all sorts of species. A great example would be Boo here. Boo is what we call a common wombat, which is a name I don't particularly like because in some areas they're certainly in a lot of trouble. But overall, they're listed as a stable species. What a lot of people don't realise though, is her cousin, the Northern Heronose Wombat, is one of the most endangered species on the planet. They number only about 250 today. Now, a couple of years ago, the Queensland Wildlife Parks and Fauna Service basically put out their recovery program, what they want to achieve with the Northern Heronose Wombat over the next 10, 20 years. And one of the things that they laid out is that they would like to have a sustainable captive breeding population of northern heronose wombats. The issue is, currently there has been zero success keeping and breeding northern heronose wombats. There's only ever been two kept in captivity. One was a, a wombat named Joan. She lived to the age of 20 something and she lived semi wild. She was actually kept by a farmer, not a zoo or a trained person in the natural range of them and we've got no information about how she was kept. The only attempt from a zoo or a wildlife park to keep this species is Taronga Western Plains Zoo out in Dubbo. They got permission to, to trap and bring one into captivity to try and adjust him and become the beginning of a future breeding program. And unfortunately, he only survived seven months after being brought into captivity. 
So what does this have to do with keeping and breeding common species? Well, today, there isn't anybody sort of willing to take the risk with such an endangered animal, bringing them in when we don't know what's happened last time. What a lot of zoos and wildlife parks are doing is spending a lot of time looking into the husbandry requirements and how we look after both the common wombat, or forest wombat as I call them, and the southern heroners wombat, who are less endangered. And what we hope to one day do is take all these skills that we learn from these less endangered species and reapply them to the northern heronose wombat if we get the chance to start bringing these into captivity and contributing to the survival of that species. So by breeding more common species, we learn all sorts of things that might help us help endangered species. The common species in captivity also actually go towards helping endangered species. There's a couple of rock wallabies today that are only alive in the wild due to what we call embryo or joey transfer, where they've taken joeys from an endangered species of wallaby, given them to a, a foster species from a more common wallaby to raise that joey so the endangered one can reproduce faster. So common species in captivity can play a direct role to helping their wild counterparts. The other thing as far as this learning and why it's so important to, to understand how to care for an animal is that by breeding and, and researching and caring for species that aren't endangered, if ever they do become endangered, we don't have this northern hair nose wombat scenario. We already know how to do it. We've already got it on the record, we've done this for years before, and we can pick the ball up and start rolling it from there. So it's really important to know that we know what we're doing before we really have to know what we're doing. So that's number two. By keeping and breeding less endangered or more common species, we're gathering all sorts of knowledge that can help the more endangered species out there and ensure the survival of the less endangered species well into the future. The third reason that zoos and wildlife parks might be appearing to keep and display animals that might not spring to mind when you think of endangered wildlife is that whether or not an animal is endangered is a lot more complex than just how many is them overall. And a good example is the Woma python, like Tanami here. You see, overall, the Woma python is not considered to be an endangered species. They're considered quite secure because they've got a very big distribution. And in a lot of those areas, they're doing just fine. But what a lot of people don't understand is in some parts of their range, we have distinct subpopulations that are separate from the main distribution. And some of these are in a lot of trouble, particularly down the bottom end of Western Australia and in parts of South Australia, where local populations who are genetically distinct, or maybe in some cases genetically extinct, are on the brink of extinction. So a zoo might be conserving a species and breeding a species that you might think don't really need help, but that animal might be coming from a population that is actually really significant as far as conservation goes. And there's lots of examples of this. Even the common brush tail possum, one of the most common and abundant species of animals on the east coast of Australia, in some parts of their range in central Australia, are actually in quite a bit of trouble. Even things overseas like caribou or reindeer, a lot of people are unaware, are actually made up of several different subspecies. And some of these subspecies are incredibly numerous to, to rival herds in Africa of wildebeest and things. Others, on the other hand, are literally clinging on to existence. They're on the brink of extinction today. So that's the third reason that zoos and wildlife parks might be keeping a common species. Just because it might be common overall or common to your mind, doesn't mean that it's a species that doesn't require some conservation effort. So, as I said, it's a bit more complex than how many is there. So there you go, guys. That's just three of many reasons why zoos and wildlife parks around the world keep, breed, and display species that aren't necessarily endangered species. Just because they're not on the brink of extinction doesn't mean we don't need to look after them. And whether you're endangered or not, it's important for us to learn about all of them. Because at the end of the day, people are only gonna conserve what they understand. They're only gonna understand what they experience. So the best way to experience wildlife, in my opinion, is to get people up close and personal with them. Other than that, guys, as always, I hope you've enjoyed our video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, or like us on Facebook, leave a comment, all that sort of stuff. And if you wanna become involved with Wicked Wildlife and help our videos come out more regularly, there's two things you can do. You can either join us on Patreon, where you can leave a contribution that will help our videos come out more and more regularly and teach more and more people about Australian wildlife, or you can head over to wickedwildlife.com and purchase one of our t-shirts. We've got a bunch of different designs there and there's more coming soon, and all the money from that goes towards us getting further afield to visit some more animals to bring you some more videos. So other than that, guys, thanks for watching. Be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care.